Hi everyone, today I'll show you how you can implement functional programming in C Sharp. If you haven't watched my video on the five rules of functional programming, then go ahead and watch that first because everything we're going to discuss today will make a lot more sense if you watch this first. Functional programming is one of those programming paradigms that has a lot of theory behind it. It can trace its roots all the way back to the 1930s with the inception of Lambda Calculus. However, we're not going to get too mired in history today. The main thing you need to know is that functional programming treats computation like a mathematical function. So there's no side effects, just pure results based on input. Some pretty impressive languages have been designed entirely around these functional principles. For example, Lisp, which is considered the grandfather of functional languages. But then there's also Haskell, which is another popular functional language. And then Erlang, which was built for concurrent and distributed systems. And of course, there's F Sharp, which is Microsoft's own functional programming language. Now, C Sharp is not traditionally a functional language like F Sharp. It's an object-oriented language centered around class hierarchies and interfaces and similar things like that. However, that doesn't mean that you can't do functional programming with C Sharp. Over the last few years, a slew of syntax features has been added to C Sharp that make functional programming feel much more natural and integral to the language. And if you adhere to these features and avoid creating a load of abstract classes and things, then you can actually write a significant portion of your C-sharp code using functional programming. First up then, let's discuss pure functions. Here's a pure function in C-sharp called add, which simply adds together two integer arguments. You'll notice I've declared this as a static function. Now you don't have to necessarily declare your functions as static, but I've done that here to emphasize that this function doesn't require any surrounding context or any local object variables in order to run it. So much like an instance function would need something in the parent class, this static function is saying this doesn't, this is on the global scope and it only operates on the inputs that are passed into it. Now this add function is a pure function because all it does is it returns a new value calculated from those original arguments, x and y. It doesn't mutate the arguments and it doesn't produce any side effects. It simply generates a new value that is the sum of those two arguments. Here's another example of a pure function in C sharp. This time it's operating on a string. The string function is only returning a new string calculated on the arguments that are passed in. So again, there's no side effects here and there's no need for any external context. These two functions can be declared as public or first class functions within your code. And you can pass around references to these functions anywhere and you can import them into other parts of your code so you can execute them. Or you could put them in a class library like a C-sharp function library and then they can be deployed to NuGet and consumed by other people's code. No code inside either of these functions needs anything external to run. They're pure functions and they're written in C-sharp. Next up, we're going to look at another functional programming concept, and that is immutability. Immutability in functional programming refers to data structures. It's one of the tenets of functional programming that data structures should be treated as if they can't be changed. C Sharp offers a number of features that allow us to enforce immutability on data structures. So let's take a look at a few of those now. C Sharp provides an immutable data type known as a record. If you create a new type as a record like this, then once you've instantiated it, or you've assigned some data into it, then the data can't be altered. So this action here wouldn't be permitted by the C-sharp compiler. You can still pass this record object around just as you would with a class, but you can't modify the data inside of it. If you wanted to change one of the properties of this record, then you'd need to actually create a new record instance with that property altered. With record types, we can achieve this with the with operator. So this statement here means copy all of the properties from this record and merge in this object on the right hand side. Let's consider a more practical example. So initially we have a more object oriented approach where there's a user class here with a mutable name property. Now let's say that we had a function to change this user's name. So this function change username. It takes the user class and the new name as parameters. Now, because this is object oriented and not purely functional, in here we can simply assign user.name equals new name. So therefore we're mutating the user class to update the name. 
Now let's rewrite this code into a more functional style that utilizes pure functions and immutability. Instead of a user class, we'll use a user record. So we'll create a new record called user with the same properties on here. So that's now an immutable data structure. So because this is immutable, it isn't possible to change the name property after the record's been instantiated. So you couldn't pass an instance of this back into the same function that we used before. So the function can't be called change username. So instead, we're going to create a new function and we're going to call it with new name. This function will have to return a new version of the record with the name field altered. So we're passing in this user, which won't be changed, but we're returning a new version of the user that has the name property updated. So in here we can do return user and then with a name equals new name. So that gets merged into the return result. This syntax is reminiscent of the spread operator in JavaScript or TypeScript. Applying immutability like this can make your code much more predictable. You know that when you pass that user object into a function, the function isn't going to mutate or modify the argument. In functional programming, it's all about creating new results and not altering any existing state. Lastly, we're going to discuss function composition. This is where things get really interesting. Function composition in functional programming involves creating new functions by combining smaller functions together. So we're going to build a function pipeline here in C Sharp by threading the output of one function into the input of another. As you can see here, we've got two inline functions called add one and double it. The third function here composes double it and add one into a third function. So if we do console.writeLine add one and double one five, this will be the equivalent of invoking double it function and then invoking the add one function. We've just put those two together into one composed function. So here we're treating the functions much more like you treat variables. The initial example showed an add function with two variables coming in as arguments. Well here with these Lambda functions or these func classes, we're treating the functions as if they're variables again. And that's a fundamental concept in functional programming, where functions are treated as first class citizens, just like variables or any other parts of your code that can be passed around and modified. So there you have it. Even though C Sharp is not strictly a functional language, we've demonstrated that you can definitely use functional programming techniques in your C Sharp code. And if you follow this, you can result in more predictable and more testable code, and that makes your life as a developer considerably easier. So why not put some of these ideas into practice in your own code, and let me know in the comments section how you get on. I'm always eager to hear your feedback and suggestions, as it helps me produce more useful and engaging videos for you on the channel. So until next time, this is the Train to Code YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.